But anyways, uh, this is a project to uh, celebrate the spring equinox and the fall equinox. And it was sponsored by Trevor McDuff, KS1 LAS, uh, who uh, operates a uh, educational uh, project to encourage students to get into uh, STEM fields. And uh, he works with a lot of educators and he came up with the idea. We did a, a number of launches uh, last year, which uh, involved the STEM in 30 Smithsonian Institute Science Program. It's a online uh, video program, and I think they probably already also put it up on uh, public media as far as television. And so they uh, he he worked with the Smithsonian Institute to uh, fly ten balloons across the country, and they flew an APRS Sky Tracker with the thirty-six inch Mylar party balloons, and. So most of those only got a couple of day flight out of out of them, uh, upwards of a week or two. So then he came up with the idea of getting some more funding locally, uh, found some funding sources. And if he shows up, I can tell you how he got funding for this project. But he managed to get funding for 15 Sky Trackers, 15 SBS 13s, and a little extra for uh, for uh, doing some uh, conferences, we did a number of Zoom calls. So I'll go into the Equinox launch project. So the idea was to get as many educators around the globe to uh, launch simultaneously during the spring equinox. Um, Joanne is coining the term mid-altitude balloons to differentiate this from high-altitude balloons. So uh, this is a comparison of your typical high altitude balloon. Uh, your payloads can run hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, 12 pounds, two to three hours of flight time total, but you make it to over 100,000 feet or 30,000 meters plus. Uh, in comparison, a mid altitude balloon or what we commonly call pico ballooning, uh, the whole Balloon and payload cost under three hundred fifty dollars. Uh, the uh, the Pico satellite payload is usually around twelve grams or less, and they can stay aloft for weeks, months, and sometimes a year or more. But they all float around twelve to thirteen or fourteen thousand meters. Uh, the party balloons, the little foil balloon you see there, is a thirty-six inch diameter made by Qualitex. And there is a difference between, um, you can't just go to your party balloon store and say, I want the large silver balloon. It won't probably work. Uh, we buy them, I get mine from balloonsfast.com and I'll put that link in the uh, chat room. And that's made by Qualitex and it's a very high quality multi-layer balloon and seems to last for several weeks. Uh, I also tape over the filling port with some Kapton tape just to help with um, leakage, which the primary leakage point is through the filling port. Uh, some people put glue in there. So, but typically we get about two to three weeks on one of these uh, Mylar balloons. However, there's a bigger balloon, the SBS 13, which uh, is sold by Scientific Balloon Solutions. And there's Joanne. Hi, Joanne. Uh, Hi. Joanne KM6 uh, BWB. And uh, she's out in Los Angeles and is a teacher there, a STEM teacher. And she was instrumental in uh, organizing the spring equinox uh, event. So the SBS 13 is a bigger balloon, uh, but it costs $150 or more. So, but it will fly you around 43 to 45,000 feet. In other words, 12 to 14,000 meters, which gets you above most of the uh, weather systems and greatly increases your chances of going around the world multiple times. Uh, with the little 36 inch uh, Mylar balloons, 
um, you'll be floating around 8,000 to 9,000 meters or 27,000 to 30,000 feet. And so you're greatly at risk uh, of hitting storms, a lot greater risk. There's one flying right now on a uh, Mylar balloon, um, Whiskey 7 Papa X-ray Lima-2, and it's battling storms in Texas, but it's been aloft for 12 days and it went in a circle around British Columbia for a week. Just went in a big circle. And then it came to Alabama, went to Georgia, then it went west across Alabama. I turned on my balloon magnet and then it ended up in Texas and now it's uh, approaching some storms in, the, in Texas, but we'll see if it's still flying today. So the uh, Sky Tracker weighs 12 grams. Uh, it has power film solar, flexible solar panels. It's got a U-Blox, uh, Max 8 and Max 7, a uh, little chip antenna. I use the Arduino development environment to program this. It's all coded in Arduino code, and it's an Atmel 328P processor. The uh, output synthesizer is a Cypress CY22393, which is a little harder to set up than a um, the SI 5351s, but it gives you 20 milliwatts as opposed to about 10 or 12 milliwatts. So in Whisper in particular, that gives you a little advantage. That 3D advantage comes in handy. But uh, I use pl uh, flexible solar panels because kids handle these. The students like to put their hands on it. And if you have the monocrystal in cells, they'll just crack right as soon as you, you can breathe on them, they'll crack, but they're very, very fragile. This can ram into the ground and it'll be just fine. Uh, they're less efficient, but uh, I've had one sitting out in the field for a year and it still worked. We got one recovered from a cornfield in Minnesota. So this is the timeline. Um, and uh, Joanne, do you want to Tell a little bit about uh, how we, uh, how you trained, uh, communicated with the teachers, and how we find found teachers and ham radio operators. Sure. Um, so my background is that I am now a science curriculum coach, meaning I train teachers in science for a school district. But before this, I was a science teacher for an elementary school, which is where I um, started working with Bill and things like that. Um, so I have, I almost always try to keep some trackers just on standby because you never know when an opportunity presents itself to, you know, circumnavigate. Um, so the timeline really, it honestly, it just depends on what aspect you want to go off of. If you want to go off of geography, if you want to focus on the math, if you want to focus on meteorology. Um, so it can easily be a culmination project of a quarter, of a semester, of a term. It could just be, you know what? Everything is absolutely right. The jet streams perfectly overhead. Let's launch this, let's see what happens, and then let's backtrack. Let's research based on what happened and see if we can put the piece of the puzzle back together to discover what happened. Um, so, you know, the timeline is really anything that you're interested in doing, we can make happen. <laughs> it's and, it's and such what, an amazing- What age thing. groups are your students, uh, Joanne? Um, I have done it with kindergartners. Um, obviously I do <laughs> the filling myself when I'm working with the five-year-olds, but, um, I've, I've had, I've had my kindergartners launch normally in terms of actually being there filling, uh, the youngest I do is about third grade, fourth grade. Um, but my kindergartners are coloring in a U.S. map and then a world map of the country, the states and the countries that we go over. Older grades are researching um, a lot of the information, like, uh, you know, information about the countries, what languages do they speak, what foods do they eat. Um, even older kids are then can do a lot of the mathematical calculations. What is hydrogen versus helium's lift? When would it be more appropriate to use other ones? Things like that. Oh, that's great. And uh, 
you held multiple Zoom uh, training sessions with the teachers and their amateur radio mentors. So this is an example of one of those sessions. How many Zoom sessions did, did you do to prepare for the Equinox launch? Oh, heavens. Um, I'd say all together between uh, trainings just to tell people what we were doing in the first place and then trainings on how to use everything. I think I did 10, 10 or 11 of them. But in terms of actually training the teachers themselves, uh, probably four. And one of them was a three, three and a half hour session. Mind you, that's because we were doing it internationally. So actually the, the woman in this photo on the very bottom screen, she lives in Nigeria. And so we had just finished doing the training. I was exhausted and she popped on because it had just become morning for her. And so we did it again. <laughs> um, but again, just proving that we had, I think four different continents represented in this launch. Definitely three, I believe we had four altogether. Um, and it was, it was amazing. It was phenomenal. It was a lot of fun. I will mention that finding a ham radio operator to help out in Nigeria was probably the most monumental task of this. And she has yet to launch because the mail takes so long for equipment to get to her, they actually lost her SBS 13 that was originally sent to her and they had to send another one and she finally did get it. So she'll be probably launching uh, in the next few weeks, I would guess. Uh, but she uh, works at a space agency in Lagos, Nigeria. So she's pretty technically uh, savvy and does a lot of STEM education outreach kind of thing. So, so fantastic. And how were the teachers in the school selected? Uh, did you just put the word out for uh, it, to participate? Yeah, in this case, um, because the way I got a hold of Trevor in the first place was from doing the cross country Pico balloon race. Um, and I had just sent out an all call to anybody that would listen. And um, I'd wanted somebody just as many people on the West Coast, just so that we could do a West Coast to East Coast. Um, and again, just the amazing networking that is ham radio. So some of my friends started following the chain and got a hold of Trevor. And so he did his first launch with me. Well, I guess with us on the east to west or west coast to east coast race and then he caught the bug and so describe, describe that race uh, wasn't there a goal to the first west coast yes. balloon to uh, achieve a certain area yeah so that one was fun that happened right when we were hitting the quarantine and so everybody was kind of trapped at home and it just you know, we're trying to find something to do. The kids are losing focus. The teachers are stressed to the nines. So um, I had been friends with Ted Tagami, who's also a balloon operator and a ham radio operator and things like that. And says, hey, how about I just race you across the country just because why not? And he said that he was in, and then Liam Kennedy, who's another balloon operator and ham radio operator in Southern California agreed to it. Um, so, you know, that was how we got everybody sort of going. Um, and I'm a huge space geek, absolute huge space geek. Yeah, that's me in the bottom right hand or bottom left corner and Trevor in the bottom right corner. Um, so we made our goal to hit the East Coast time zone. That was our official line as opposed to saying New York or Alabama or something like that, just because we didn't know where it was gonna reach. And um, the finish line ended up being in Canada, which I wasn't anticipating, which obviously the timeline or time zone sort of changes up there as well. And so I had prematurely said, oh, this balloon won. And Bill went, actually not for a little while longer. Went, oh, whoops, <laughs> just because the line had changed. Eastern time um, kind of jogs around a little bit on Ontario. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, I and I didn't do my calculations far enough that way. Um, but I believe it was, uh, Leem's uh, balloon actually landed in Nova Scotia mm -hmm. on, from that it, flight. And we had a balloon. There's a school that does a number of uh, HAV launches in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And 
we told them about it and it was being picked up by an APRS station. So it was obviously in a tree for several days and they went out in the backwoods and battled black bear country and they recovered it from the tree and they and all the way from Los Angeles to Nova Scotia. And we uh, and they I think they plan on eventually maybe this fall making a relay race out of it and launching it again because it was in perfect mm -hmm. shape hanging in a tree in Nova Scotia. It was so, uh, it was fun. <laughs> so anyways, uh, tell us about your launch here. Now I've got some pictures of the Equinox launch, which we did oh, as sweet. close to the spring Equinox as we could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yes, we did this and this was phenomenal. Trevor had never launched a balloon. He had heard about it and he actually had a transmitter, but I think he had just never fully done it before. Um, he actually didn't have his ham license at the time. So he had a, um, a kind of a colleague who had a call sign that worked with him. And he quickly went and got his technician and his general license and then started launching. So he and I were in communication that he wanted to do a fully simultaneous international launch at the moment of Equinox and everybody's perspective or respective locations, which was a phenomenal idea until we reminded him that over half of us would be in the dark. Like our launch time was 2 a.m. And so we shifted that to saying, here's about this six hour window. Let's 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 launch within this window, if at all possible. And I think we got 12 out of the 17 balloons up within about that time. There are still, again, the woman in Nigeria hasn't launched and there were a couple that still had struggles, but the vast majority of them were still up within, I'd say about a four hour window of yeah. the moment of Equinox. I have an uh, image of that. So there's Joanne on the left launching from Los Angeles with KM6 BWB-3. And uh, by the way, there's a, uh, a Lithuanian group that's been flying Pika balloons. It's LY1 BWB. There must be something <laughs> about those three initials. Uh, Trevor's those brilliant on the right white there. balloons. Yeah, what was it? Those brilliant white balloons. I mean, you oh, gotta say. There you go. Uh, so he's launching from the Reach Museum, which, uh, they have been uh, very instrumental in uh, supporting this effort and finding funding for this project for future efforts. Um, so that's in uh, what's what city is the reach in? That's central. That is um, in near the Tri Cities area. It's uh, so near Pasco, Pasco, yeah, Washington. Pasco, that's that's it. That's uh, yeah, that's that's the closest main city. Right, and then. Um, we had uh, Jenny McCall out of uh, Lexington, Kentucky, and my friend Ron Malinowski, WX4 GPS, uh, who has chased many balloons for us uh, in the past. But this is his very first uh, Pico balloon. And they launched WX4 GPS 11. And Todd, KN4 TPG, and uh, I'm not sure who was with you on that flight, Todd. Uh, they launched K4 UAH 7 from uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Todd, did, do you know who the other student is with you? Yeah, yeah, he was uh, another student and part of the Space Harbor Club. So we had, uh, I think, three other members from the club there helping out the launch. And that one uh, ended up springing a leak and coming down a couple hours later, about 80 miles south east of us, and was in a tree transmitting for weeks on Whisper. And we were going to go out after it, but a F5 tornado came through, well, it was an F3, and actually there were some fatalities about a mile from where we thought it had landed and wiped out the whole town of Ohatchee uh, where we were gonna go after it. So we decided uh, not to go recover. And by the time we figured they'd gotten the debris cleared from the tornado, uh, it stopped transmitting. But it was transmitting for at least a week or more from that tree every day around noontime. And then uh, Jack uh, KM4ZIA and Audrey KM4BUN, uh, they launched theirs at night. Um, they decided that the winds were too high during the day on both Saturday and Sunday of the equinox period. So they figured they'd go right at midnight, uh, which actually probably was closer to the actual equinox time. 
Uh, but that also eliminates the solar heating effect because sometimes the balloons look fine when they uh, when they are released on these SBS 13s, but then solar heating effects and turbulence during the daytime can adversely affect them reaching float altitude. And they reached a perfect float and in fact stayed up a long time. So here's a map showing 15 of the balloons launched right at uh, on or about the uh, equinox KG7 KY W-2, that's Amy Allerton from Utah. She launched hers a couple of days earlier because of the weather conditions. But um, these are all the balloons simultaneously flying. We had uh, VK3ZWI-6 uh, from Melbourne, VK3ZWI-5 uh, from uh, Western Australia near Perth. Um, they were both flying. In fact, uh, I believe he launched another one because that one hit. They both hit a big tropical storm near Fiji and came down. So he launched yet another one. And then our uh, Ignacio um, down in uh, Buenos Aires, LU1ESY-18, launched one from Argentina. And then uh, you can see there's a whole pile of them there across the Midwest and the West Coast and the East Coast. So uh, those are uh, that's the live map taken on uh, on the equinox day. Now um, I may have mentioned this in past GPSLs, but you can actually on an on an APRS FI you can grab the Street View icon and drop it on your balloon and see the street view view of what's directly below your balloon. So KM4ZIA-3, just at the point where they crossed the coast and entered and finished their transatlantic crossing, this is the Irish coastline as seen directly below their balloon. So when you're in a classroom setting and they're following this online, this just adds a whole nother dimension because you never know what you're going to see on Street View. And this is just a random sampling of Street View images by the balloon. And it really teaches them geography, which um, is sorely lacking in school education nowadays. I bet you if I drew a map with the states surrounding Alabama, they wouldn't be able to fill in what the states are. And in fact, Here's a really interesting one. Uh, on their second lap around the world, they flew over the set for Tatooine in Star Wars over the country of Tunisia. And we actually found the, uh, the street view. I was watching the street view. I said, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that looks familiar. And that's, that's one of the sets on uh, Star Wars, which was filmed in Tunisia. In fact, they have several sites in Tunisia, but this was one of them. So well, that was a close encounter there of the Star Wars kind. So um, most of the balloons, several of the balloons did circumnavigate and um, some of them met demises with weather conditions and a few of them didn't make float. Um, one, there's a wave condition over the Sierra Nevadas where uh, one of the balloons, the TED KK6UUQ, you could see the ascent rate just as he went over the Sierra Nevada range. He hit, it's like a standing wave. The wind comes over the Sierra Nevadas, creates this huge updraft. And glider pilots in Nevada can stay up for eight hours at 30,000 feet by, by this condition. And of course, in spring, in March, that's when the peak uh, wave action happens. And you could see his ascent rate go from about one meter per second to over two or three as soon as he hit that and it just popped his balloon. So uh, terrain and weather is definitely a factor. But the the night Rider launched at night from Atlanta, Georgia by Jack and Audrey stayed up 80 days and went around the world four and a half times. They finally came down in June over uh, Eastern Siberia. However, Amy's balloon from Ogden, KG7KYW-2, was last heard just a few days ago. Now she's, this one's on, um, sorry, 
that uh, ZIA is on whisper mode. So we get uh, reporting at all times. It made a detour almost to the North Pole there in the Arctic. Well, Amy's balloon has been lurking in the Arctic for most of her flight, which probably explains the, uh, the longevity. And so we actually don't know how many times she's been around the world and she does the short path around the Arctic Circle. And every once in a while it dips down in Norway or Siberia and we get a report. So on July 4th, it was uh, over uh, just east of uh, Finland and after dropping down from Svalbard Island. And she has been aloft for 108 days since the spring equinox flight and is probably still flying. So I expect to see this again in the next few days. So be looking for this one, but that's incredible to go from the spring equinox past the summer solstice and still be flying. So, um, and so she, she wins the prize for the longest balloon for the equinox launch. And uh, Jack and Audrey's balloon are second place in 80 days. So instead of around the world in 80 days, it's four times around the world in 80 days. So uh, that's, do you have anything additional to add about the uh, equinox and what plans are for the future? Is Trevor on with us? He was at a beach house in, uh, in Oregon. So I don't know if he's gonna be able to, he's probably at the beach today. Probably. Um, we've talked a little bit about a fall equinox launch. Um, the tough thing with the fall is, <laughs> because it comes right after the summertime when teachers are taking, especially this year, a very much needed break. And so it's a lot harder to get in touch with educators when they're focused and things like that. Um, and then you also have to start balancing the weather because you, know, you can't, you need to have nice clear days and I'm very spoiled for weather in Southern California. You know, I'm looking outside, it's clear blue skies and it's hot, but not too hot. And so it's easy for me to launch in October and September and November, but oh, most of the- for that matter. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> middle of January, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but the vast majority of the country or the world, that doesn't, that isn't, quite so easy. Um, so we're, we're working on it. So it may just be more of a springtime thing as opposed to a spring and fall. Um, I'm not sure to be perfectly honest with you. We haven't, we haven't talked lately about it, so we'll see. All right. Well, it's a great project and a great way to get students involved, um, in STEM fields. And, uh, I know a number of the teachers involved Several of them already had their ham radio license. I know Amy, KG7KYW, she's a teacher in Ogden. She had her ham license. Uh, but uh, several of the teachers that experienced ham radio for the first time through this ham radio ballooning um, are uh, actively interested in getting their amateur radio license. So, and several of the students are as well. So it's, it's a great way to to get new blood into ham radio as well. Well, I thank you, uh, Joanne. I'm, I've got some odds and ends about other things. I'm gonna talk about the rest of my talk. So if, uh, if you have any more to add, uh, go right, right ahead of what you, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you use ham radio ballooning, uh, both the latex flights in your classroom. Uh, you do some uh, standard latex flights too, right? I do. Um, I actually, I got originally into ham radio by doing the high altitude latex flights. And so I did, I started in 2016 with those. And so I've launched four of them again with my elementary school students. I've had adventures the entire time. Um, I've had one land 18 miles offshore in the Pacific, had one land in the Salton Sea, had one land in um, the middle of some chaparral in the desert, and I ended up needing to be rescued by 911 with the helicopter, so that was fun. And our latest one was this past, actually the super launch last year, uh, we launched just a thousand gram balloon, and 
my partner had never done amateur radio and I didn't realize the tools that she was using and we ended up creating a Faraday box. So we weren't able to track anything. Um, and fortunately, I, my, I had a radio on board and every once in a while it sent out a ping and we were actually able to recover it, which I have no clue how. I, I couldn't tell you anything about it, but we were able to recover it. So we're good. Uh, I want to hear more about the 9-11 uh, rescue <laughs> from the balloon chase. <laughs> that was a fun one. Um, yeah, my dad and Tom Carter, KI6RC, and I were out there. And yeah, it was it was entertaining. Uh, we had a balloon anomaly that it and had. So we had a premature burst. So rather than all of it exploding in every direction, it burst out of one little section and the rest of the balloon wrapped around the parachute and snapped the radio or the, yeah, the radio antenna line. So we then had a, you know, three pound brick falling at 98,000 feet down into Los Angeles. So we were really, really happy that it happened to land in the middle of the desert because if it had done that like 20 minutes earlier, it would have been in Los Angeles. And so we were happy um despite that but yeah it was it's it's a saga it's fun um yeah tom's wife is not allowing him to retrieve balloons anymore he can launch them but he's not allowed to retrieve them <laughs> so <laughs> i'm i'm i don't disagree um i do want to launch again my new school district is really excited for me to launch some more i'm excited to launch some more i'm completely healed from that that was in 2018 um so i'm ready to go we just need to you know get it to the point that more students can be out to join us and raise some funds for helium because the cost of helium has gone up just a little bit since 2018 so once we get those two things figured out, then we'll fly. Just a quick question. Where do you get funding for school uh, HAB projects? That one's tough. Um, it depends on what I'm doing. So in I've now worked in two different school districts doing these balloon launches. So I talked to the Ed Foundations. Um, in, in our areas, we have education foundations that are essentially kind of parent donations for lack of a better phrase, but they also get uh, corporations and stuff like that to support for schools. Um, sometimes I just write grants through like AIAA, ARRL. There's a lot of, honestly, there's a lot of money out there if you're willing to write a grant, if you're willing to put in a little bit of legwork and a couple late nights of typing and creating and things like that. Um, I think one of the things that's so phenomenal about ballooning, both Pico ballooning and high altitude ballooning is the cross-curricular components that it's not just a science experiment. It's not just a thing for middle school students. Um, you know, when I launched the balloons, I, again, I work with kindergartners through fifth grade is my, my main peak audience. And a lot of what, my pushback is, is people saying, well, you can't do this with elementary. You can, you just need to focus it a little bit different. You need to be very strategic on what you do. But I teach my students why a balloon pops. So we talk about buoyancy and air pressure and outside pressure and inside pressure. And you now our, my six and seven year olds are running around explaining why a balloon bursts. And so once I can get that in with community members, a lot of times they're going, you know, I would, I want to do this with the kids. I just need some more money for the helium. And so it's a tax write off. And that seems to work out really well as well. So they will then push forward. And, you know, I'm actually, I'm meeting with a woman next week that she's been watching what I've been doing for a while and she wants to support. So I'm going to come in and I'm meeting with her and talking about what I'm doing. And she's like, I just want to know more, but I definitely want to make this more of a reality for you. So it's really just getting, getting the ideas out there, getting your voice out there, be ready to write grants, but just letting people know of what you want to do and being specific and the money, the money ends up coming through. I believe Trevor 
correct me on this, but uh, didn't Trevor get a, a good chunk of the funding for this Equinox from uh, one uh, sponsor, one family in, uh, in the area? Yeah, there, there's a, um, a family, I think that's now like an LLC, but um, it's a family that he was, his name's Dan Lee, and he was very instrumental in getting it going that he just, he was very, he likes STEM. He likes these ideas. He likes these projects. He could see the cross-curricular aspect and wanted to make it a reality. So yeah, he donated, I want to say it was like $5,000, something like that, somewhere around there in order to get anybody who didn't have a tracker or a balloon to get those things. So the, all the educators had to do was somehow find helium. And I know like Jenny McCall out of Kentucky, she was one of those that, you know, she got the tracker, she got the balloon. Um, I know, I remember you helped set her up with a ham radio operator that was in the air because she didn't have her call sign. And then she went to, I think it was air gas and said, hi, you know, explain the entire situation that she's doing this for the students. And is there any way? And they donated the helium for her. So she was able to do this completely free, which was phenomenal. That's quite a feat from Erica. <laughs> it is. It, Jenny's amazing. <laughs> I'm impressed. Well, thank you. And we look forward to future Equinox flights, whether it be the fall or the spring or maybe a solstice launch. So definitely, definitely. Thanks for having me. Sure. Well, um, any questions anybody has for uh, Joanne uh, before we move on? I've got some odds and ends I wanted to talk to about some different aspects and modes. Actually, just real quickly, I'm just super happy to meet everybody here. Um, I've been doing having for a long time. I've just gotten into Pico. And one of the things that I've always wanted to do is get involved with STEM education. The only place I've ever had luck is expensive private schools. And I came from DC and probably worked with the most expensive private school in the nation. And it was really disappointing. There's so many underserved kids out there who really could use this stuff. Um, I'm currently involved in a proposal. Let me see. Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland, California is uh, joining forces with uh, NASA Ames and really expanding, and there's a big opportunity to have a ham radio presence there. And certainly balloon, ham radio ballooning would be a big part of that, or could be a big part of that. So I'd really be looking for any help that you can give me in a proposal, ideas for curriculum, that sort of thing. I'll leave it there, thank you. Uh, Martin, where are you located? I'm in Berkeley, California. And oh, by the way, I get, I'm, I'm hooked up through UC Berkeley, and we have a contract with, or whatever, an arrangement with air gas. So I just stroll in there and buy helium or hydrogen. I, I don't even bother with helium anymore. I just buy hydrogen. And right. they don't even ask me what I'm doing with it. I just go in and out, and I'm done. Do you know Ted Tagami? He launches from Berkeley, and he's tied in with a bunch of schools and has a program doing uh, STEM education, and he's He's been flying a lot of my payloads out of Berkeley. I've emailed him and it seems yeah. like he has a business and didn't really want to talk very much. Oh, huh. it's KK6 UUQ. I used to live yeah, in, yeah. I used to live in uh, what I call Drizzly Peak Boulevard, Grizzly Peak. <laughs> cool. Uh, very cool. So, Gordon, I, I just sent you a direct message with uh, two email addresses. So send me an email and yeah, let's let's definitely talk because I've written entire curriculum on ballooning. Thank you so much. And, of course. And uh, just really, I'm piping real quick too. If you need some help, I'm about a nine hour drive away in Southwest Idaho. So I have family in the Bay Area, so I could probably help you out a little bit also. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I was out in Berkeley in the 1980s. I worked at Varian in Walnut Creek, but I had a house up there on the Berkeley Hills. I wish I still had that house on the Berkeley Hills. 
Um, likewise, I'm, I, I do some work with a couple of different schools in this area, mostly with high school students, uh, as well as being obviously university uh, amateur radio club advisor. Um, I'd be interested in knowing if, if some of the grants you mentioned, I know you mentioned ARRL has a grant or that you applied for, uh, if there are other sort of generic grants that aren't specific to school systems, uh, that you're aware of, that kind of information would be the kind of thing I might want to share with teachers that I work with. So that might be the kind of thing that we should brainstorm with people who work with, with schools and grants and things to get that sort of information out so we can all compete with each other for that limited funding. But <laughs> so you're not saying nothing, I know. But <laughs> I was going to start talking, all of a sudden I went, wait a minute, wait, wait a, a minute. minute. <laughs> Sorry, I, I misspoke. There were no grants. <laughs> But I can see you're all you're filling them out as as we speak to get the first to email it in. <laughs> That's right. Joanne gets right her first first submission. Five minutes later, the rest of us go. <laughs> um, but uh, that might be good information for us to collectively gather. I think because yeah. uh, as I say, I'm working with a, a just as people ask about the other sources for this. The one school I work with, I work with them every year. They actually have a, a class, a technology class, and the technology teacher works with me. They launch HABs every year. Mm -hmm. They have their eighth graders design the experiments, and they have their juniors and seniors build the payloads and uh, do the tracking. So uh, it, it's like the, 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 uh, the older kids helping the younger kids to do their experiments. Uh, and I, I assist it. them with tracking and things like that. And they also do PICOs, and they've got a PICO flight in the air right now. My wife's call sign on it. Um, that's been up for uh, about a month and a half now. Uh, so I work with them. I just got reached out uh, with another teacher I worked with like four years ago who suddenly got the bug again because he saw me posting on Facebook about the PICO flight for this other school. And his background is in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. And he's like, these PICOs really fascinate me. I'm excited again. And so he's got a summer camp coming up, a technology camp. And he's got the kids for a week and wants to do a PICO flight in that week. And uh, so we're, we're working together. And so he managed to get some funding for it. But um, again, just finding funding for these things is, uh, is usually the challenge. So I, I'd appreciate to hear more from you. I'll, I'll get your email address and drop you a note. <laughs> Definitely. Um, great. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the spot trace. Some of you have used this as a backup tracker. Uh, their new version of the uh, firmware and software now actually outputs altitude, but it states on the uh, website that they only work up to 21,000 feet. Well, uh, Tom, W5KUB, uh, told him about he should fly one in his first uh, HAB flight that he did a week ago. And so he decided to call the spot trace uh, engineers and say, is this a hard coded limit or why is that? Said, no, no hard coded limit. It has to do with temperature. If the unit falls below a certain temperature, apparently it drifts off frequency and it won't communicate with the satellite. It uses the Global Star satellite network. So what he did is he put it right on top of his digital camera, which generated a lot of heat. Um, I was worried that it would also generate EMI, but it apparently handled that. And I've, uh, by the way, there are, look like, looks like they're on sale now for 50 bucks, but keep in mind, this is a subscription service that goes with it. But 50 bucks for this is a pretty good deal. Uh, I always fly one of these on a big latex balloon as insurance. And there's an updater. Uh, you have to set it up uh, for if you buy the uh, the the extended service um, for two and a half minutes. They call it extreme tracking. You can get two and a half minute updates with latitude, longitude, and altitude. And you set it up with this updater program. And uh, also, when you do set that up for two and a half minutes, make sure you set it up for 24 hour status updates because if somebody finds this package, takes it home, every 24 hours, it'll update where it is and you'll find out who took it. So we actually had this happen once. So basically it, uh, I had one sitting on a table in my kitchen and it transmitted its 24 hour status for 11 months without wiping out the batteries. Now, obviously during a flight, it's using, 
it's battery a lot. So that'll lower that, but just sitting on the table, it operated for 11 months with that 24 hour status. It gives lat long altitude and, and status on how the voltage is doing on the batteries. So, but, but make sure you do hook up to, there's a little two screws in the front of it. Then there's a little USB port and make sure you, you do set it up when you get your spot unit. Um, there's different plans. There's a monthly plan, there's a yearly plan and uh, buy the extreme tracking for $4.95 a month or $59 a year, it's worth it. <clears throat> so by heating the spot unit up, keeping it warm, Tom managed to get it to, to track an entire flight. I've never seen a spot a trace or a spot of any kind do the entire flight right up to 108,750 feet. Uh, it was reporting its position right along with APRS and it matched perfectly. So um, the secret is to keep it warm. There's no hard limit. However, there is one gotcha. I don't know if you can see that, but it's only showing 9,000 feet. And this happens right as, uh, and I'll show you uh, the reason and see if you can figure it out. It stops reporting the altitude correctly above 32,767 feet. Anybody have any idea why that is? Maybe the uh, cartoon will tell you. It's a bite boundary. They decided to uh, cheapen their transmissions to Global Star by using a 16 bit field. And they didn't want to report altitude any higher than that. <laughs> they figured no one would be using this on a vehicle tracking or uh, hiking above 32,767 feet. But the good news is it rolls over. Now I analyzed this for a while and I says, it just goes wonky after, after it hits 32,000 feet, it's just sending strange addresses, strange altitudes, but that's not true. If you add it to 32,000 feet, it was reporting correctly. And then it hit 64,000 feet and it rolled over again. It rolled over three times on Tom's flight. And if you add that to three times 32,767 plus that 9,000 feet, you'll get 108,750 feet or close to it. So the altitude works and all the way up to 108,000 feet. Uh, you just have to keep um, track of how many times it's rolled over 32,767 uh, feet. So that's a little bit of tid tidbit, keep it warm. And the altitude's correct as long as you keep track of how many times it's rolled over. Now, I just wanted to show you uh, what I use in my vehicle and at home. I use a Funk Cube Dongle Pro Plus for my home station and also when I'm chasing balloons. And it's just a wonderful receiver, it does VHF, UHF. I use this for the 403 megahertz. Uh, radio sons and the uh, ozone sons uh, use it for two meter APRS and it does a fantastic job on HF whisper so and any mode on whisper but it's one of the few dongles that works well on the HF bands the drawback is it's about two hundred dollars US but so it's about ten times the cost of some of those cheaper RTL SDR Cost about 25 bucks, but it's worth it. I don't even have my regular ham station radio, my big TS2000. I don't even have that hooked up anymore. I just use this because it. I work with HD SDR, and some of you all use SDR Sharp. It'll work with that as well. And this is my uh, receiver for ham radio ballooning, and uh, you can. It has a nice waterfall display showing the frequency uh, frequencies in a range. You can set it up for any frequency bandwidth, uh, and it's a great little combination. 
HD SDR or SDR sharp and uh, one of those dongles and you've got a great little station that's portable. Uh, did you code 8PRS? I use mixed W. This is absolutely my favorite APRS decoding program, uh, mixedw.net. But you can also use the free direwolf program. It's just harder to set up. You have to set up a, a text and knit file, and it's kind of tough getting the audio link going. This one actually comes with that uh, a virtual audio cable program as part of it, so you don't even have to set that up. Because I do online, uh, oh, I'm, I use uh, APRS IS32 for my iGate software, although you could also use. Uh, direwolf. So uh, we also take the ozone data from SkySond and it outputs an NMEA string from SkySond and I can feed that into uh, the APRSIS 32 and I can post the uh, ozone sond and regular sond positions up on tracker.havhub.org and APRS.fi or the sond uh, have hub that they've, they've created. So uh, those are some really interesting things you can do with that. Also, I have decoded uh, uh, APRS from Siberia this way. I basically tune in one of those remote uh, web SDR radios, and uh, they don't have any APRS I gates in Siberia, but they have remote radios in Siberia. And so I tuned in 144.800, which is the European frequency. And sure enough, uh, I had predicted it was going to be around Barnall, um, Russia, Novosibirsk. And I heard my beacon on, on 144.800. I copied it through my, that virtual audio cable program. It links it into the mix W. And I, I gated it from 7,000 miles away. So that's a really cool way. And you can do that with Whisper too. I've listened to Whisper balloons all over the world by going to different remote radios and feeding that audio into WSJT-X, which is the Whisper decode program. So uh, those are some interesting things. Uh, I'm working with a new little mode that's kind of fun. I first did this for W5KUB's flights. He wanted the slow CW, QRSS means really, QRS means slow down, QRSS means really slow. So there's a grabber page, and this is the website for it. There is, people have software that captures what they see on different bands and puts it up on this main page, and you can click anywhere in the world on these different screens and see what slow CW they're picking up. And uh, I use a program called Argo, which is a really cool audio program that is designed for these QRSS modes. Uh, this is a, um, I've been converting my sky tracker board to, uh, since it already does 20 meter whisper, uh, Mark K9SDX told me about the free, the license free hyper band. 14 kilohertz wide centered on about 13.556 megahertz. And a few of them are running Whisper down there actually. So I modified my Sky Tracker to do 20 meter Whisper and then it switches and does 22 meter Whisper on 13.555.418. And then it sends a slow CW. It sends two minutes of regular CW at 10 words a minute. Over on the far left in that red box, you'll see little blurps. That's the 10 meter, the 10 words per minute CW going off. And then it sends SZX, which is the last three letters of his call sign, because it's license free, you don't need to send the whole call sign. And that was received from a uh, thousand miles away in Vermont. And this is a five milliwatt transmission. You're allowed to operate up to five milliwatts on the hyper band. So you can see the S, the Z, and the X. That's called QRSS6, which means that a DIT is six seconds long. QRSS3 is also a popular mode, 
and the dit is three seconds long. So people are running these all over the world and uh, there's a lot of activity on this hyper band that you can watch. Uh, but go to Argo and you can download this free program. Um, this is an example that I downloaded from one of Tom W5KUB's flight. I added QRSS CW to his regular whisper uh, protocol. And so it would send whisper and then it would send a slow CW message. And you can see um, at the time his payload was off the west coast of Morocco. And I tuned into an Ireland uh, web SDR 2300 kilometers away. And you can clearly see W5KUB in Morse code on the slow CW. So it's an interesting new mode that we can try on these, uh, particularly these HF Pico balloons. Uh, one last thing, there are some people experimenting with putting live images on Pico balloons, Pico payloads, uh, DL4MDW. I hope I got that call right. Um, uh, he's developed a, uh, they're developing a uh, payload that apparently is not very heavy because it was flying pretty high on an SBS-12. It's been around the world once. And he sends down images on packet transmissions on APRS. And it's the same format that they use in Europe for uh, SSDV video on the higher speed uh, UHF license free modes. But these are images that were downloaded uh, to his website. He brings the data from APRS to a server and then he reconstructs the uh, image data. So it is possible somebody, everybody always asks, why can't you put a camera on a Pico payload? I says, well, it's probably too heavy. And then how would you send the data down? So apparently this is, he said he was using an OVP 430 camera. I think I got that right, but I'm not sure. You'll have to look that number. It's an OVP series of cameras. So um, it is possible to do, and they're working on it. And then lastly, uh, Tom has been working. Uh, he's trying to make a super pr pressure balloon out of these, uh, but the material stretches a bit too much uh, to be usable. Uh, he found a plastic manufacturer that makes an actual tube of plastic. So you only have to seal the ends, but it's extruded as a tube. And so um, he's going to cover it in a net uh, and try and restrict the uh, restrict the uh, expansion of the balloon that way. And so uh, that was just one of his first ones on the left being tested. And then he actually flew that one on the right he calls that Moab, mother of all balloons. And he actually, that one took off, went to about 50,000 feet, and then sprang a leak and came down right on the coast of South Carolina. And they actually found it in the tree. It was about a mile from the Atlantic Ocean. But too many alligators, too much swamp land to be able to get up in the tree to recover it. But he has a picture of it up in the tree. So these are some things that's going on. And uh, I believe that's about all I had today. So back to you, Mike, if anybody has any questions. Yeah, does anybody have any questions for Bill? I can comment, I, I exchanged a few messages on Facebook with the guy who's doing the, uh, the camera on the Pico. I think he's basing it on an ESP32 cam module. Um, and those are cheap too. They're like five bucks on Banggood. And so, uh, and it's using an ESP32 chip, which is a very capable chip. Um, uh -huh. So I, I'm pretty sure that's what he's, he's uh, used for his, uh, um, his uh, Pico there. So that's, that's a really interesting project to me too. What is he using for the camera? Uh, the ESP32 cam comes with a little camera module. Uh, I think that the, the model number that you, you said was the correct one. I, it, you know, I've got a few of those little modules around. Um, 
when you catch them on sale at Banggood, you can buy it for five bucks. And it's a camera module with Wi-Fi and the SP32 for five bucks. It's ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> or maybe 10. I think it's $5 without the camera and 10 if you have the camera on it. Um, so I think all he did is he wired in GPS to it and, and uh, I think a low raw module. And uh, I think that's what he's using. Well, actually, he's just sending down the data in APRS. Oh, okay. So he probably hooked it up to some kind of APRS module. Then. Yeah. Yeah. And he probably uh, was using LoRa as well. Yeah, I was talking to Thomas, Bill, uh, trying to get Thomas and Sven to join us uh, just the other day, but he's been on a business trip. So him and Sven are flying across Europe uh, with APRS in their airplanes. Kind of interesting. So maybe they might be able to join us tomorrow. Uh, I think they're supposed to be back uh, back home tomorrow. But they're the ones developing this, right? That's right. That's right. One of the pecan balloons, the 11C, I think, was the model number for this last one. Yeah, they were incredible pictures. That was of the Scottish mm -hmm. Highlands, and you could actually see the the lock lakes that there were. It was a lot of detail in it mm -hmm. from uh, 40,000 feet up. I see Christoph commented here that the ESP32 cam has an OV2640 camera. So okay. uh, that's in the chat if people are interested. Um, Bill, the other thing you mentioned that I'm curious about, and I actually wanted to pick people's brains here, so that's a good segue. You mentioned that you use MixW for AWS, and I'm not familiar with that one, um, so I'll, I'll definitely look into that. Um, I have uh, built another APRS transmitter based on actually the SI5351B, uh, which you can use to modulate. It's got a VC pin, and you can modulate. And I have code working that modulates APRS on it. And it sounds perfect, it looks perfect, and it doesn't decode. Um, and so I don't know if it's a software issue or if it's a modulation issue or a deviation issue. And so I'm curious if anybody has experience uh, trying to get what sound like plausible APRS tones. And I'm using you know, the standard Traculino encoding stuff. So I, I think the software I'm using is fine. There's a flag symbol after the uh, relays um, that you have to set a bit to one that they don't really document very well. And that has gotten a lot of people developing their APS code. But if you're using track Lino code, that should have already been. Yeah, because I basically grabbed track Lino and where it's doing PWM, I'm actually using a DAC. Um, right. so I, use a, I use a parallel, well, I use a parallel DAC for the tones, for the 1200 and 2200 hertz tones, uh, because a serial DAC wasn't fast enough to work with my slow uh, 328p Atmel chip. Uh, yeah, with the, with the uh, ESP32, it's, it's plenty fast enough. Um, OK. So, but yeah, it's just not decoding. And I don't know if I, it, maybe I need filtering on it because the DAC is noisy or what. So well, I'm I... actually looking at different software decoders, including Direwolf and Sound Modem and a few others to see if I can find one that, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced it's not a protocol error um, or it's just some tool that would give me some indication of why it's not demodulating properly. Um, and well, I, I will tell you that uh, uh, I put a little simple RC filter, it's 330 ohm and uh, 0.1 microfarad right at the output of my DAC because without it, it's so noisy that it won't decode. Uh, it cleans up the sine wave beautifully with just that simple RC filter. Uh, you might try 330 in series and 0.1 to ground, and uh, that'll clean up if there's any noise coming out of your DAC. And Mike, you what I've what I've done is recorded the received audio onto like Audacity, and then you can actually go in and zoom in on the waveform, and you can actually hand decode the, the packets. And I found protocol problems with that. It's it's uh, pretty tedious. That's because that's, that's tedious because I've done that. I've, I've looked at it in Audacity, and you know I've compared it to a, a known good and mine in Audacity, and they look similar. But yeah, I haven't had quite the uh, the, the moral fortitude to go through and try to figure out. Okay, that looks like it's twelve hundred. That looks like it's twenty two hundred, and figure out which bits are which. That's a, that's about where yeah, it's I usually the line and said, boy, somebody should write a program to do. Oh wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so it's usually either in the header or there's that checksum on the end is usually what yeah. bites you. The checksum yeah. will bite you. Um, the uh, I wanted to mention uh, 
one advantage of Pico balloons, but uh, availability, I go to a mom and pop welding supply shop to get my helium and hydrogen and I buy it in 40 cubic foot tanks. Um, I don't go to air gas. I have an account with air gas, but these small welding supply shops are deal like to deal with the public off the street or small businesses or small farmers, any, anybody that I work with. Air gas is a little snooty about working with, um, unless you have an account, but a big account. The bigger, the better, they pay more attention. But I buy this 40 cubic foot tank for $38 and it doesn't matter whether it's hydrogen or helium, it's the same cost. Now that's a little high for hydrogen, granted, since you could get a big 200 cubic foot tank for that on hydrogen, probably 50 bucks. But I like the fact that it's so lightweight that I can, it's not much heavier than one of those cheap balloon time cylinders. Um, this weighs maybe 10, 15 pounds max. Um, and it's very transportable. So, but I just go to my local small town welding. So they get it from air gas. I just walked in, it says, I want a 40 cubic foot tank of hydrogen. And she walked out in the lot, there you go. I didn't have to sign my life away that I was going to blow myself up or anything. And the same goes for helium. You know, she said, oh, I got a helium tank too. Which one do you want? So they had it right there in stock. So, uh, and then I buy one of those little party balloons. You put a regular regulator on it, or you can, uh, somebody mentioned they had to buy a new regulator for uh, hydrogen. Well, you don't have to. You can buy a CGA 580 to CGA 350 adapter, which I'm showing right there. That's a, a helium regulator on a hydrogen tank uh, using that adapter. So if anybody runs across that, I saw that in the uh, GP, GPSL list the other day that somebody had to go ahead and buy, uh, buy a hydrogen regulator. Hey, Bill, can they fix yeah. those uh, those regulators? The helium regulator part of ours is uh, doesn't work anymore. I can turn the valve off and I can turn it on, but you can't adjust it in any way. Any way. Do you know if they fix these? Oh, I don't know. Um, if you take it to your mom and pop welding shop, maybe they can. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not sure if I know one of those, but I have an account over here at uh, uh, Prax Air. They might be able to fix it for me, I suppose. Okay, if you're doing a yeah, if you're doing a long duration flight and you want to see where it's going to go without having to go and manually run a high split, no a high split prediction, uh, you can email the people on their uh, on the uh, high altitude IRC list on web chat and talk to the UK high altitude folks and they can and say I want to add a high split button on tracker.habhub.org for my flight. And they will do that for you. And then, then you hit that button, it'll show your track. But you have to let them know, or they, it doesn't do this automatically. Hey, Bill, one more question about that 40 cubic foot tank. Actually, it's cool I'm working with. Uh, I mentioned that there were smaller tanks, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, did you yeah. uh, buy the tank itself, or are you renting the tank and buying the I'm tank? renting it, but I'm trying to buy one. Uh, they're looking into buying a tank for me, so I don't have to give if I keep this past a month, it's $10 rental for the tank. If you don't keep it that long, then um, I don't think there's a rental charge or minimal anyways. Yeah, because uh, right now I'm paying rental on a couple of big 200 cubic foot tanks for all the flights I do. Um, right. and I would, and, but once upon a time when I got a smaller helium tank going back five or six years, uh, if it was like under 150 cubic foot, you could just buy the tank. Um, I and, think you can. Uh, it's just, they would still just swap it with you. They'd inspect it, but they'd just swap the tank with you. So I wasn't sure if that's what you were doing with these. Yeah, Prax Air didn't let us buy it. They, they almost charged us enough for keeping it too long, uh, the monthly rental to buy one, but uh, they wouldn't let us buy it when we asked. Yeah, yeah. I do an annual rental on my hydrogen tank since I know I use it, you know, so and that way I, I don't end up wasting any. I use up one tank and then just start the next and then I replace one empty tank and, and just keep two going that way all the time. Well, these people will actually uh, um, 
refill your tank if you want to wait a few days or they'll swap your tank out for another one. So they're pretty easy to work with. Oh, that's the SBS 13 in flight. So you can see the difference between that and the party balloon for those that haven't seen seen that. Uh, I see we are up at time. So okay. uh, yeah, so we are, thank you, Bill. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're at time for your presentation. So next again.